um, uh, explain a little bit about about how the dub sound came well, came about. Dub is um, well to start with. How I I picture dub is that it, it's, it's a breakdown of rhythm tracks, right? In the in the sixties, when you had a two sided record, that had to go because you know. When you could um, do one song and actually utilize the rhythm, you didn't have to put two good songs on a record. You know, you to me you're like throwing over. Yeah, yeah, you know. But um, the version came in the um, the '69 period when you'd have a good solid vocal on one side, and then you take the voice out and you just run the rhythm, and that's what we used to call the version. Okay, well, after the version became, you know, obsolete, you know, people to call, DJ started tossing on the rhythm. You know, and that's how the DJs have actually got themselves involved. You know, after coming with Shoki and um, Sir Lord Comic and then Stitch, Sir Lord Chin, yeah, I understood that he passed away last week. You know, and, um, then it was a matter of playing around now with the variations of tracks and you know, we had the opportunity to have the facility of the four track where you have drum, well sometimes we incorporate the drum and bass on one, then we have the pure rhythm track which is a piano, the rhythm guitar, the lead guitar and percussions or sometimes you just throw the percussions in with the drum track because you, know, you have the hi-hat and so forth. So then you'd have like a horns and then a vocal. So you'd strip everything down and just put a little reverb and echo. Yeah, like what you did right here, you know? You know? And, um, you know, you play with these things and then, you know. You all can hear that, right? This, this, well, yeah. that, 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 Ish, you, you, want, very, you, you need to hear it more, more, right? Yeah, we, we can turn it on. But I'm just saying that um, it was more considered um, in my time for sound system. And what happened after you cut these dots with your sound systems, like um, you know, in my time we had like Arrows, we had Emperor Fate, uh, you know, Tubbies was around, we had um, uh, Stereograph and these other guys that were up here, you know. I had a sound system myself. I heard this. Yeah. Uh, I heard this. But it wasn't a big sound system because I kind of got scared of how you know guys would get out of hand. Right. You know, and drink and get drunk and then smoke and then get crazy. I had a dance up my GC headquarters myself and um, Pablo. And the guy rode his motorcycle right through the, 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 the party, yeah. the dance. Yeah. And he hit down some people that were you know, having fun. You know, knocked over a few tables and created a scene. And the party had to end right here, you know, because obviously, you know, you know um, people got hurt and you know, the police had to be involved. You know, so I saw it as something that I didn't really want to kind of get too, too, you know, so I decided to. Right. But it was fun while it was, you know, it was a long. I had some good times with it. Too. And the dub remains a, a staple of the of the of the sound system of the party. It's, I mean, well, it became commercialized because mm -hmm. the the dub albums then started to come into play. Like you know, after taking B sides like um, like even a song like this, you know, we have the vocals and then we strip it down and put the drum and bass on and um, you know people gravitate to that you know mm -hmm. you know, then, you know then the local thing you know right right but um it became more popularized after you know other producers got involved like uh, scratch had blackboard jungle um herman shinloy had the aquarius dog and um, Joe Gibbs had the African dubs and, and everyone started to get a piece of the action. But the Java Java dub was primarily just versions and dub tracks that we just put together and we call it Java 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 dub. And to me that, you know, I, to this day I still feel that that was the first dub album. 
I think a lot of people feel like that was the first dub album to this day. And then there was you know, speculation. Oh, was, you know, Blackboard John was this, was that. You know? If Errol was alive today, he would probably say, no, 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 it's Java, Java, Java. Right, right. And then I did one called Randy's Dub, but that was done later on after Errol left. You know, Joe Gibbs uh, did up. Um, this album is actually part of the Randy stuff and um, we incorporated the Randy's because Randy's dog only had like about 300 copies pressed and they were pressed on uh, this blank impact label. This is actually one of the original presses too. Hmm. Yeah. Don't hold it up too much because I see, I know there's collectors in here. Well, <laughs> I see you, I know you, I know. <laughs> I know you. Yeah. Um, and Toronto's full of, of these people that will just snatch that from you. <laughs> no, no, they would snatch it. They would ask nicely. Yeah, no, they would probably ask if they could buy it. That's right. It. That's the right word. But anyway, um, yeah, the dub became more popularized after you know, the creation of it started. And we have other genders of dub. We have, you know, dub steppers now. Mm -hmm. British and you know, like Jashaka doing dub, the um, um, Germans and doing dub. So it's you know. Is it, does it surprise you the, the 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 reach and the far scope of the music? Because you, you're talking about you know the Germans have their dub and the and the British have really really embraced it. Does it does it? Um, is it a surprise to you how far-reaching this is now? That the fact that this music is way past where it started. If you had asked me this like 40 years ago, I tell you though, no, I would not know clue. Mm. But growing, you know, into the business and being around, you know, the family business over the years, I saw where it, it, it had the momentum to go further mm. because you know. During the early 70s, it, it, it elevated, you know, as it went along. You know, in the 80s, when um, Jamis came in and started doing more work out of um, Waterloo, uh, no, sorry, Waterhouse, run by Tobis, and then we had a young guy by the name of Scientist. And, um, you know, everybody was kind of really gravitating to dub music because, you know, it. it it had its, you know, it had its, um, its feel, you know, you could gravitate on it, you know, you didn't have any hard words for you to understand, it's just music, you know, it's just in and out and, you know, doing the effects on it, you know. You know um, Top is really kind of um, put a lot of spice into it, you know, you know it is, it is uh, mixing on the dub. After um, all these producers would record their um, tracks run by Dynamics or by Harry or Landis or anywhere they would take their tapes, take it run by um, Tubbs. Say, Tubbs, mix the tune. Right, right. Going into the, into, uh, the studio with, with Java, with, with Augustus to, to record that, what would it? How did the interaction, how does the interaction work between yourself and an artist like Augustus Pablo, who is a true artist, who is, you know, his, his sound is such a distinct, distinct sound. Um. I want to get into the mind of you as the, the, the producer when you have that kind of talent in front of you. It was really hard to work with Pablo. Pablo understood primarily what it took because you know he, as I said you know he, he had his own style of um, play you know he interject himself um, and it was a it was a different time period too, you know did you pick and choose who you worked with or, or was it just no I, I pick and choose All right. because if the, if the artists weren't singing anything sensible I would want. Right. And that's why I backed away from a lot of the DJs because some of the DJs to me they were just you know mark you they had really good DJs and then you had the ones that were trying to be DJs. Right. 
And the ones that were trying to be GJs, I just couldn't work with them. Okay. And then there were some of the artists that uh, think they were, that they were Batman, and they could bring their badness into the industry. And I said, no. And I backed away from quite a few of them. You know? And I'm not going to mention names. I don't no, offend, I don't are wanna, you sure? I don't want to offend anyone. <laughs> but, you know, I would tell them, just leave the studio, man. <laughs> leave the studio. <laughs> Yeah, that was that. That was enough. That was enough. That was enough. And you know, them will call me bad names, but back like, yeah, well, it's China, man, I tell them, we'll leave the street. I said, let's leave the street, no man. You know, you're saying, leave the street. Yeah. <laughs> That's how that song came about, actually. You know, I was trying to look for it. Uh, ordinary, ordinary, was it ordinary man or ordinary version? Mm. It's going to come. But anyway, yeah, you have good, talented, um, you know, musicians and artists. We try to hit the best. You know, I, I, I'm actually to me, Dennis Brown is one of my really diamond. You know, what was it like the first time you heard that voice? Could, do you remember? Do you remember what it was like when, when you when you first heard him? It was right after he left Studio One. Earl from um, the Heptones brought it down, you know, and um, he said to me, Clive, you know, Dennis, um, I bring you a, a young artist by the name of Dennis. And I said, all right, sure, you know, we'll listen to him upstairs, because, you know, we couldn't listen downstairs, you know, children, records were playing and all that, so we took him up, and, you know, he sang the first few verses of the song called Cheetah, and I was impressed with that. Uh, he did another song and I was impressed with it. And, um, we booked a studio and, you know, when I say we, you know, myself and Harold, we book a time. Because, you know, by that time the studio was running 24-7. You know, there were so many independent producers that wanted to use the studio because you didn't have Channel One running at the time. Neither did you have uh, Harry J or um, Aquarius. But at the time you had like, you could count on your five fingers, you know, you had Federal, you had West Indies, which became Dynamics, then you had Treasure Island, Bond Street, and you had Brentford Road, and then you had Randis. And then afterwards, the other ones you know, came into place. So Randis at the time was, was the studio to me. That was the, 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 the studio. And it was very central. You didn't really have to go too far. You take a, a bus into town, it was right there at North Parade. If you were central, like, um, you know, Money Lee was run Orange Street, um, Scratch was run by Charles Street and Beeson Street, I think it was Charles Beeson. Then you had Derek Harriet of King Street, he used to use the studio a lot. And then you had Clancy Eccles run by Church Street, and you know, you had a lot of record stores down there. That that was, uh, and Sonia Pottinger was down by the bottom of Barn Street, or in the Gay Feet. Um, you had Rupi Edwards, Phil Pratt. Um, yeah, well, now he came after, yeah. But then you had Joe Gibbs. But Gibbs never used to really use Randy so much. You know, it was more the uh, West Indies and that. Until he had opened his own studio. It's just an incredible legacy when you think of, of all of the the names and the, and the faces and the musicians and the, and the impact now uh, that they're still having.